Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to take a look at the AP Physics 1 review packet for uniform circular motion and gravitation free response. Remember to pause and rewind the video as necessary. Let's begin. In problem one, we have eight cases below showing a moon orbiting a planet. The moon's planets and orbits all have different masses and radii according to the diagrams. As you create the following rankings, you are strongly encouraged to write symbolic expressions for each quantity that you are ranking in order to best uh, make judgments in ranking. Part A. Rank the moons based upon the net force acting upon them from greatest to least. Well, net force, if we're talking about the net force between two objects, this is a universal gravitation problem. Now, the normal equation we would use for universal gravitation is F is equal to big G, which is the universal gravitational constant of 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, times mass 1, times mass 2, divided by the distance between the center of the masses squared. Now, <clears throat> this is useful if you have the known masses and the known distance. But if you're using relative values, such as doubling or tripling or quadrupling or taking half of certain values, then we're best served to look at universal gravitation as simply a proportion. So F is proportional to, we'll say, big M, the mass of the planet, big M, times little m, the mass of the moon, divided by r squared. Let's take a look and let's rank these scenarios a through h. f is proportional to Big M times little m over r squared. Now, the way we're going to fill out and use the proportional reasoning version of the equation is we're going to place a 1 any time the object is one mass unit or has not changed. We're going to place a 2 if the mass is doubled, place a 4 if the mass is quadrupled, and so on. So we're going to put the relative differences between the masses and the distance rather than absolute numbers. So for instance, in case A, we can see the planet has a mass of 4m and the moon has a mass of m. The distance between the center of them is about 4 times the radius. So I'm going to replace this with 4 1 and 1. 4, 1. Oh, I misspoke right there. That should be 4, not 1. And if I compute this, I get 4 over 16, which is 1 fourth. Okay, and what that really means, ladies and gentlemen, is that that's one-fourth the gravitational force. So we're going to be filling out the same proportion for all eight examples. So we're going to, and I just kind of call it bubble times bubble over bubble squared. We've got to fill out the bubbles. So I'm just going to copy this a few more times, and we're going to fill it out with the given information for those scenarios. So B 
in case B, we have uh, 4M, 1M, and 1R. So 4M, 1M, 1R. And that would be 4 over 1, which would be 4F, or 4 times the gravitational force. Letter C, we're going to go 4M, 4M, and 1R. That would be 16 over 1, or 16 times the force. That so far is the largest gravitational force. And in case D, we have 1M, 4M, and 4R. And we have 1 times 4 is 4 over 16, which is again 1 fourth F, or 1 fourth the force. Let's do the same for E, F, G, and H. F is proportional to bubble times bubble over bubble squared. Now, in the case of letter E, we have a mass of 1, a mass, a relative mass of 4. The moon is 4 times greater than the planet, and there's a distance of 1 r between them. So 1, 4, and 1. That would be 4 over 1, or 4 times the force. Letter F, 4 times the mass of the planet, 4 times the mass of the moon, 4 times the distance, 4 is all around. And we get 16 over 16, which is essentially 1 F, or just F. Letter G, we have nothing but 1s. And letter H, each, the moon and the planet are both relative value of 1, but the distance between them is 4 times greater. So 1, 1 over 4 is 1 over 16, or 1 16th the force. So now we're going to use that to rank our values. The greatest one is going to be C. We can see that's 16 times the force. And that one is greater than... B, which is 4 times the force, but you can see that's also the same as E. So we're going to write B is equal to E because they have the same ranking. And then 4, well, what's a little bit lower than that? Well, that would be uh, F and G. F and G are both equal to 1. And 1 is just a little bit greater than 1 fourth, so that would be A and D which is greater than H, which is 1 16th. <clears throat> okay, part B. Rank the moons based on the acceleration from greatest to least. Well, we're going to use a similar idea. This is gravitational acceleration. So universal gravitation, this is universal gravitational acceleration. And if we take this idea here and we remind ourselves that a gravitational force, which is big G, M1, M2 over R squared, is also a centripetal force. As you got to remember, something that's orbiting a moon, that's orbiting a planet, or a satellite that's orbiting something else, is essentially moving in a a circle around the object. And the gravitational force is pointing inward towards the center of that circle. In other words, the gravitational force is centripetal. And so we end up with a relation like this. Uh, but what we can also say is that there's two ways to describe the gravitational force. We can describe it this way, and we can also describe it when we're 
close to the surface of the Earth where the gravitational field is constant. And that is mg. So if we set those equal to each other, mg equals big G, big M, little m over r squared, you can see we end up with big G, or little g rather, the acceleration of gravity, is equal to big G over r squared. So it's very much the same equation, but it's really just the mass of the planet being orbited and the radial distance of that planet. Now, uh, again, if we don't have actual masses and actual radial distances, then we could just treat it like a proportionality. And the gravity is proportional to the relative mass divided by the relative radius squared. And so we're going to be using that one eight different times. G is proportional to bubble over bubble squared. And let's just copy that down eight times. Let's begin to fill these out. So let's go back up to case A. Again, you only care about the mass of the planet. This is the planet, not the moon. So I don't care about the moon for this particular example. Let's see, so the mass of the planet has a relative value of four, with a relative radial distance of four. So 4 over 4, that would be 4 over 4 squared, which is 16, which is 1 fourth g. 1 fourth the acceleration due to gravity. B, repeat the process, 4 and 1. 4 times the acceleration due to gravity. Letter C, 4, 1. Again, four times the acceleration due to gravity. One and four. One sixteenth the acceleration due to gravity. Letter E, one and one. That would be one times the acceleration due to gravity or the acceleration due to gravity. Four and four. That would be 4 over 16, or 1 fourth, the acceleration due to gravity. G would be 1 and 1, or 1 times the acceleration due to gravity, and H would be 1 and 4, or 1 16th, the acceleration due to gravity. And we'll use these relative comparisons to rank our values. The largest would be B and C at four times the acceleration due to gravity. So B and C are both the largest. Uh, the next largest down from four G would be, well, it would be one G, and that would be E and, let me see, E and G. So both E and G are one G. A little less than that would be probably one-fourth. Yeah, so that would be greater than A and uh, F are both one-fourth. And one-fourth is a little bit greater than one-sixteenth, which would be D and H. So a couple of those equal to each other. But that would be our ranking for the acceleration due to gravity from greatest to least. Part C. Rank the moons based on their orbital speed from greatest to least. Okay. Now, for this one, we're going to go back to what was stated a little while back, and that is the idea that 
gravitational force is a centripetal force. I'm going to rewrite this as big M, mass of the planet, little m, mass of the moon, is equal to mv squared over r, and because gravity is a centripetal force. Well, the mass of the moon cancels, one of the radial distances factors cancel, and so we have v squared is equal to g big M over r, uh, which means v is equal to the square root of big G big M over r. And again, if we're looking at just sheer proportionality, the orbital speed is proportional to the square root of m over r. And that's what we're going to be working with. So v is proportional to the square root of, and we're going to plug into that. Again, copying the same proportion down eight times, because I'm going to repeatedly use it. So at this point, go ahead and pause the video and copy it down eight times and unpause it when you're ready to resume. Okay. Let's take a look at each example. So in A, I care about the mass of the planet. That's the planet's mass and the radial distance of the planet. So it's very similar. I'm using the same values that I used for the acceleration to gravity, the exact same ones. So in letter A, it was four and four. Well, four divided by four is one, and the square root of one is one V. For letter B, it's four and one. Well, four divided by one is four. I'm using those values there. 4 divided by 1 is 4, square root of which is 2, twice the velocity. So the, that has twice the orbital speed. Uh, for letter C, again, I'm using 4 and 1. 4 divided by 1 is 4, square root of which is 2. For letter D, I'm using 1 fourth, the square root of which is 1 half. Uh, taking a look at E through H, well, 1 and 1, I'm using those values there for planetary mass and radius. And 1 divided by 1 is 1, square root of which is 1 V. Uh, for letter F, again, I'm using 4 and 4, just like I did A. Again, getting 1 V. Uh, similarly with G. Uh, but the last one, I'm using 1 and 1 fourth. And so for that one, I'm going to get 1 half V again. So to rank my orbital speeds for this one, the greatest seems to be uh, 2. So B and C, again, are the highest, followed by a bunch of cases where it's 1 V. So that would be A. Sorry, that's... Than a, uh, which is the same as uh, E, which is the same as F, which is the same as G. So there's four of them that are the same. Now well, that's a little bit greater than Oops, let me fix that value there. Okay. Uh, that's a little bit greater than one half V, which would be D and H are both half the orbital speed. <laughs> Part D, rank the orbital moons based on their kinetic energy from greatest to least. Okay, well we saw just a second ago that big G 
times big M little m over r squared is equal to the mass of the moon times velocity squared over the radius. Well, a bunch of stuff cancels and we end up with v squared is equal to big G m over r. Well, if you recall, your kinetic energy formula is one half little m v squared. So I can substitute this for v squared. And I have a new value for the kinetic energy of planetary orbit. And that would be one half times little m times big G big M over R, which translates to big G, I'm going to write the big G first, big M times little m, all divided by 2 R. But again, ladies and gentlemen, if we're looking for proportional reasoning, the kinetic energy is simply proportional to the product of the two masses divided by 2R. That is the proportion we're going to be working with. Bubble times bubble over 2R. Pause the video and copy this proportion down eight times. Okay, we're going to be using both masses and the radius this time. So we're going to be using the same values we used for A, M1, M2, and R. So the first one is 4, 1, and 4. And 4 times 1 would be 4 over 8 would be 1 half the kinetic energy. In case B, we're going to be using, in like we did in part A, for B, 4, 1, and 1. And 4 times 1 is 4 over 2 would be twice the kinetic energy. C, I'm going to use 4, 4, and 1. That would be 16 over 2, which is 8 times the kinetic energy. Part D, I'm going to use 1, 4, and 4. And we get 1 times 4 is 4 over 8, and again I get 1 half the kinetic energy. Part E. I'm going to use the same values that I used in part E of part, uh, of case E in part A, 1, 4, and 1. Which is 4 over 2, or 2 times the kinetic energy. In case F, I'm going to use 4, 4, and 4. Four times four is 16 over eight is again, two times the kinetic energy. And letter G, I'm gonna use one, one, and one. One times one is one over two is one half the kinetic energy. And letter H, well, I'm gonna use one, one, and four. which is one-eighth the kinetic energy. 
So let's go ahead and see how these rankings fall out. The greatest one seems to be letter C. That's eight times the kinetic energy, and that's going to be greater than what looks like B, E, and F. That's uh, two times the kinetic energy. And two times the kinetic energy is going to be greater than what looks like A and G, uh, and D for that matter, A and D and G are all a half kinetic energy. And that's going to be greater than H, which is one-eighth the kinetic energy. <laughs> Problem two. For each part, rank the four cases on which pair of objects exert the greatest gravitational force on each other. Be careful, gravitational force depends on mass and the center to center distance between the objects. Let's take a look. Part A, all the spheres are shown in the diagrams have the same mass and the radii, different radii shown. So I'm going to go to each picture and I'm going to make a little drawing like this. If this radius is 2r and this radius is 2r, it really means that the center to center distance for case A is really 4r. Case B, we're going to use the same logic. This is r, this is 3r, so the, K, the center to center distance in this case would also be 4r. If that's r and that's r, the center to center distance would be 2r for case c. And for case d, we'd have 2r and r, so the center to center distance would be 3r. So we're going to use Newton's law of uh, gravitation again. f is proportional to big M, little m, over r squared. F is proportional to bubble times bubble over bubble squared. Pause and copy that proportion down four times. All right, let's take a look. If you recall what was mentioned, it said that they all have the same mass. So all the masses are essentially going to be one. But if we look at the center to center distances, case A, four, case B, four, case C, two, and case D was three. We end up with 1 over 16, or 1 16th, the force. 1 16th, the force, for case B. 1 4th, the force, for case C. And 1 9th, the force, for case D. Well, the lowest in this group, of course, would be C. 1 4th is the, uh, uh, the highest, excuse me, that's the highest uh, fraction value followed by 1 9th, which is D, followed by 1 16th, which is A and B together. Now let's take a look at B. All the sphere shows have the same density and different radii. Think about how mass is affected by density and volume. Okay, this one's a bit tricky. Remember, mass is equal to density, which is the Greek letter rho. Kind of looks like a slanted or italicized P. This is the Greek letter rho. Stands for density divided by mass, uh, volume. Okay, so, sorry, I have that backwards. Density 
is equal to mass per unit volume. So mass is density times volume. Well, the densities are the same. So really, why is this important? Because mass is proportional to volume. And that's what we're going to have to figure out. We're going to have to figure out how the volumes are different and relate that and help figure out the masses. So let's try this. The distances are the same as they were before. The center to center distance here is 4R. The center to center distance here is also 4R. The center to center distance here is still 2R and the center to center distance here is still 3R. But what we have to do is we have to figure out the masses, the relative masses for each one. Well, here, the radii are the same. Now remember, mass is proportional to volume, right? Mass is proportional to volume. Now, why is that important? Well, volume, we're talking about planets. We're talking about spheres, okay? So if you remember the volume formula for a sphere, it's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Well, we could just simply say volume is proportional to radius cubed. So let's take a look at each one. If volume is proportional to radius cubed, that means mass is also really proportional to radius cubed. Since they both have, in case A, the same radius, that means mass 1 equals mass 2, right, which is proportional to volume, which is related to r squared, or in this case, 2 cubed. I said squared. I meant cubed. It's proportional to radius cubed. 2 cubed is 8. Here, mass 1 is clearly greater. So mass 1 is proportional to density times volume, which is equal to 1 times the volume, in this case, would be 3 cubed. Now, 3 cubed is 3 times 3 times 3. That would be 27. And you can see this one has a value of r. So mass 2 is proportional to 1 times 1 over, uh, uh, which is just a relative mass of 1. So in other words, in case B, for the radius, for them being the same density and the radius being 3 times bigger, what that means is mass 1 is 27 times larger. Case C, mass 1 and mass 2 are both equal to density times volume, which again, 1 times 1, both have a relative mass unit of 1. Now, in the case of D, mass 1, right, is, is uh, equal to density times volume, which is related to 1 times 2. And mass 2, again, same thing, mass density unit of 1, they have the same density, uh, but it has a, a radius of 1, therefore... Uh, go back to mass 1 right here. It's not just 2, it's 2 cubed, so that should be 8. There we go. 1 cubed is 1. And so for mass, mass 1 being uh, twice as large, twice as, the, as wide, I guess you would say, it's 8 times the mass. So one thing we had to do that made this problem tricky is we had to figure out these masses based on density and volume. So we're going back to the same equation we did before. And uh, case A, B, C, and D. And we're using the proportionality. F is proportional to, F is proportional to big M, little m over R squared. So bubble times bubble over bubble squared. We're going to fill that out. Pause and copy that down four times.
Well, in the case of A, both mass 1 and 2 have relative mass units of 8. So 8 and 8 and a relative distance between them of 4 and when squared. So that would be 64 over 16, which is 4F. In case B, mass 1 has a relative mass of 27 times greater than the other. So 27 and 1 with a relative distance of 4. So 27 over 16 is roughly 1.7F, just to be able to compare. C, both mass 1 and mass 2 have a relative mass unit of 1, relative distance unit of 2, which breaks down to 1 fourth F. And case D, mass 1 has a relative mass of 8, mass 2 has a relative mass of 1 with a relative distance of 3R in between them, which would be 8 over 3 squared, or 8 over 9, which is approximately, it's almost 0.9 times the force. And we're going to use that to go ahead and rank our scenarios. The largest one would be, of course, A, followed by B, followed by 1 ninth, which is greater than 1 fourth. Problem three. The dots below all represent a car that, at the instant of time shown, is traveling in some direction, maybe turning around toward another direction, and maybe speeding up or slowing down. Each car has its present velocity and present net force indicated as vectors on the diagram. For each of the six objects, fully describe its present motion and how the motion is changing. Please remember to use the cardinal directions, north up, east to the right, west to the left, and south going down while indicating your directions. So a couple things to consider. Uh, one, note that the acceleration always points in the direction of the net force. But also, just as equally important, you need to know how speeding up and slowing down affect the direction of acceleration along with the direction of motion. Let's review this. If an object is speeding up, the acceleration vectors and velocity vectors will point the same way. If an object is slowing down, the acceleration vector always points opposite to the way you're going. So in part A, you can see that the force, that the object is going north, that's the first thing that can be said, is the object is going north, but the force is applied in the kind of northeasterly direction. There's a force that is, now since the, the acceleration, I'm going to always write the acceleration in here, the acceleration always goes the way of the force, okay? Now, since the acceleration is, or, or at least a component of the acceleration, if I were to do vector components here, then a, a component of the acceleration is going the direction of the velocity, that must mean the object is speeding up to some degree. Since the force is pointing towards the eastern direction, that means the car is going to curve east. And so we can say the car is initially going north, but it's speeding up and beginning to turn east. B. Well, we've got a force pointing down, so the acceleration is pointing down, and the velocity is pointing down. Since the acceleration and the velocity point the same way, the object must be speeding up and does not appear to be changing its direction. So the car is going south, it speeds up, still going south. Letter C. The velocity is directed north, the car is going north. 
The force is directed east, which means the acceleration is directed east. Acceleration and dent force always go the same way. When the acceleration and the uh, force are perpendicular to motion, that would be an example of a centripetal force. Since the acceleration is neither going with velocity nor against it, the object is neither speeding up nor slowing down. This is a perfect case of a uniform circular motion. So the object will go north initially, but it will turn to the east with no change in speed. Again, if the acceleration is perpendicular to velocity, not going with it or against it, then there will be no change in speed. D. Now the acceleration is going at an angle that is obtuse with the direction of motion. And if we were to look at the, this is the acceleration vector, if we were to look at the components of acceleration, the horizontal component of acceleration is directly opposite the velocity, which means an example uh, in Example D here, you can see we're going with an acceleration opposite, so we're slowing down. Initially, we're going west, but we're slowing down as we are going west. Since they're directly opposite, we're not going to be turning. Letter E, we're going what looks to be east. There's a force directed south, which means the acceleration is south. It is perpendicular. Therefore, again, there's going to be no change in speed, and the object will curve and start turning south. Uh, last example, letter F. You've got an acceleration that's pointing in this direction here, which means a component of that acceleration is pointing in the same direction as velocity. Therefore, the object is speeding up. So it's originally going south, and there's a force applied curving it to the west, speeding up as it's doing so. Letter G. In which six cases is the network positive being done in the car network negative or zero network? Well, work is equal to a change in energy. So when the kinetic energy increased, that's when work is positive. When the kinetic energy decreased, that's when work is negative. When the kinetic energy did not change, that's when work is zero. So we're simply going to look and see when did we speed up? Increase in kinetic energy. When did we slow down? Decrease in kinetic energy. When did we not change our speed? no change, and therefore no work. Positive work is done when kinetic energy increases. This happens in A, B, and F. Negative work is done when kinetic energy decreases. This happens in D. Zero work happens when there's no change in kinetic energy. This happens when the net force is perpendicular to velocity. This happens in C and E. Part H. In which cases are the car gaining kinetic energy, losing kinetic energy, or ni uh, neither? Explain the reasoning. Well, we have the exact same situation we had in Part G it's, uh, from a backwards point of view. In other words, in letter G, we were looking at it from the perspective of positive work, negative work, and zero work, and we connected that to increasing, decreasing, and no change in kinetic energy. This time, we're asked about kinetic energy, so we're relating it back to work, which one had positive, negative, and zero work. In other words, it's the same answers as part G. Cars gaining kinetic energy in A, E, uh, A, B and F, little typo there. No, a losing kinetic energy in D. 
no change in kinetic energy in C and E. Problem four. A cart with frictionless bearings is placed on a track at point A and travels around to point B, C, D, and then B again, and then to point E. So in other words, the car does this. A student observing this motion draws the following conclusion. Quote, the cart is in uniform circular motion while traveling the circular part of the track. So during the path B, C, D, back to B again, the cart's acceleration and net force always point towards the center of the circle and the velocity always points tangent to the circle. Parts of this conclusion are incorrect. Part A. For the dots below, draw the vectors for the cart when it is at point C. Let's take a look at when it's at point C. Well, the cart would be right here on its way up. It would have the weight directed straight down. So let's draw W equals MG or FG equals MG, whichever. But then you'd have the track itself applying a perpendicular force towards the center. In other words, you have a normal force pointing this way. Well, since we have more than one force is going on here, the net force is actually in this direction right here. Which also means the acceleration is going to be in that direction as well. And will therefore not be directed exactly towards the middle. How about the velocity vector? Let's draw the velocity vector and the acceleration vector and the net force vector when it's at point C. Well, the velocity vector is tangent to the circle. So we're going to draw that straight up. That one's easy. That part is correct in the statement. The velocity vector goes straight up. The net force, as you can see, is pointing down and kind of to the left, but then so is the acceleration vector. So briefly state what is correct about the student's conclusion. Well, velocity is tangent to the circle. That relates back to Newton's first law of motion. Objects want to keep moving in the direction they're moving. And at that instant, it wants to go straight. It is the track which curves its direction. Part C. Use appropriate physics principles to explain why the motion is not uniform circular motion. The object slows down and speeds up as kinetic energy is exchanged with potential energy at various points along the loop. Also, the acceleration and the net force must always point to the center of the circle in order to be considered uniform circular motion. Since the acceleration and net force do not point to the center, remember they point kind of to the down and to the left, we know that the object is not moving in uniform circular motion. Part C. Briefly outline an experimental procedure which could be used to determine whether the circular motion is uniform. Be sure to explain any measurements to be made and what equipment is to be used. Well, we could simply set up a device called a photogate. A photogate is a little thing that you clip to the track. It has an infrared laser beam that crosses from one side of it to the other. When an object breaks the beam, it essentially starts a timer. It's like a very fancy stopwatch. As soon as the object completely passes through and the beam is unbroken again, the timer stops. So it's like a very fancy stopwatch that you do not have to start and stop. So we could set up a photo gate at the bottom of the circle to record the time through it. The velocity at the bottom of the circle would be calculated by taking the length of the cart distance divided by the time through the photo gate. Set up another photo gate at the top of the circle and again record the time to calculate the velocity. 
By doing this, it should be clear that the velocity at the bottom and the velocity at the top will either be the same if they are in uniform circular motion, or they will be different if they are not. Part E. Suppose that when the student releases the cart, it falls off the track at point D. Briefly explain what the student can do on a second trial that would cause the student to st uh, cause the cart to stay on the track at point D. So for some reason, the cart gets to this point here and just uh, falls off like that. Now, what would need to happen is one of two possibilities. One, you would have to give a little push to the cart here at A to make it through that circle. So the only way that would happen is if there actually were some frictional resistance along the way. Two, you could take the cart and simply release it from a higher position. That would do the trick as well. So again, either release the cart from a higher position than A, or give the cart a little push at position A. Again, please pause and rewind the video as necessary, and thank you.